Tomorrow, I'll be presenting a luncheon address, but today I have the pleasure of introducing and welcoming a very special guest. Professor Anita Hill is on the faculty of the Heller Graduate School at Brandeis University as Professor of Social Policy, Law, and Women's Studies. She's a recipient of the Fletcher Fellowship for her work on race and education. Professor Hill is currently a visiting scholar at Wellesley College. Professor Hill attended college at Oklahoma State University, where she got her undergraduate degree in psychology, and then went to Yale Law School, where she graduated in 1980. Professor Hill has tirelessly worked to shed a light on discrimination and abuse in the workplace. In a recent op-ed in the New York Times, she writes, today, when employees complain of abuse in the workplace, Investigators and judges are more likely to examine all the evidence, and they're less likely to simply accept as true the words of those in power. But she warns us that could change. Our legal system could suffer if a sitting justice's vitriolic pursuit of personal vindication discourages others from standing up for their rights. Professor Hill continually reminds us that we all have the responsibility to speak out, not only personally, but legislatively. And I want to say, Professor Hill, that you inspired me as a young professor at UCLA working on issues of really discrimination that affected health of women in the black community in Los Angeles. And you inspired me because you were standing up. You inspired me to stand up to people who would have denied rights. <laughs> and as the applause shows, that's an inspiration. It's, I, I, can, I honestly can say that it's touched everyone in this room. And it, goes on touching us, and now we have the chance to be inspired by you in person. So it's my deepest pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, President. Madam President, I like that. Uh, I am thrilled to be here, and there are a lot of people I can say thank you to. I can say thank you to Leslie, uh, who, uh, there she is with the camera, who was the first to contact me. Uh, there are many people, Julie, who was, uh, who was in the events program, uh, programming events office. Uh, Alicia, you know, I am looking forward to retiring one day, and I know things are going to be in good hands uh, with Alicia. And I want to say hello and thank you to my friend Deb Taft. Deb and I have been working together. She's just new at Simmons. Now, she's not really new at Simmons. She's been here at Simmons, graduated from Simmons, and now she's back, and I know you're very happy to have her here. So. Enjoy your lunch. I have a, a bit to say, but I'm gonna, I, I understand there's gonna be a question and answer time at the end. Uh, so I'll let me get started. Go ahead and eat. And, um, and if I say something uh, that interrupts your meal, just stop for a moment and <laughs> you can keep eating. Now the theme of the, the uh, address that I'm giving is uh, past, present, and future. Past, present, and future for us. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about the past, but I'm not going to go too far back to the past. I know that there were some people here from the class of 60, from the 60s. Where, were there some graduates here from? Yes, that's right. So I'm going to go back at, to the 60s, and I want to read you something. I know you don't like people don't like to be read to, but I'm going to read something to you. Uh, that is a quote from an official docu document of our government. And it reads, in essence, it's from 1965, in essence, the Negro community has been forced into a matriarchal structure, which because it is so out of line with the rest of the American society, seriously retards the progress of the group as a whole. 
and it poses a crushing burden on the Negro male in and in consequence on a great many Negro women as well. Ours is a society which presumes male leadership in private and public affairs. The arrangements of society facilitate such leadership and reward it. A subculture like the black community, such as that of the Negro American, in which this is not the pattern, is placed at a distinct disadvantage. Now, many of you may recognize some of this language. It's from the 1965 United States Department of Labor uh, report called The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, known as the Moynihan Report. And so in looking back at the past, I really wanted to go back and look at the Moynihan Report and some of the things that the Moynihan Report said in, because in effect, uh, the Moynihan Report had something to say about black community in general, but black women in particular. Uh, in 1965, in Daniel Patrick Moynihan's America, there was only patriarchy in which men dominated or matriarchy in which women dominated. To challenge poverty and injustice uh, that the black community faced at that time, Moynihan prescribed patriarchy. Many black women who had suffered from and battled racism had a very different vision. They imagined families and communities in which women and men shared leadership. However, in promoting his worldview, Moynihan made bruising pronouncements about African-American women. And I believe that those pronouncements stain the public consciousness even today. Yet, despite this public shunning, African-American women continue then and continue today to believe in and work toward bringing themselves and their families ever closer to the American dream of equality. As the makeup of all American households began to look more like, a, like the single parent black family Moynihan observed, the lessons of black women's achievements is, are in fact critical. Moreover, as the American public takes one more turn at challenging the racial divide, we must demand that black women be seen, heard, and recognized for the leadership and insight we offer. We, we must call for a new and different conversation on race and gender in America and begin that conversation in places where our ideas are both, both are, on both are formed, which is in our homes, our schools, our workplaces, and our places of worship. Again, Daniel Patrick Moynihan was looking at poverty in 1965 when he wrote his report. But he, what he did was to declare that black matriarchy had thrown the Negro family into a state of crisis that imperiled all of America. He prescribed deliberate and immediate government intervention to put black men back to work and back in charge of their homes and communities. Patriarchy, he asserted, would save America from an expanding welfare system and would save the Negro family from descending into a tangle of pathology. Understandably, government-sponsored domination had little appeal to women who still bore the scars of government-imposed racial segregation. Moynihan's assessment of matriarchy in African-American communities amounted to a stinging indictment of all black women. According to Moynihan, unmarried women would become something of community par pariahs. Married women's faith was to be subservient in their own home. But had Moynihan fully appreciated the grip that sexism and racism had on the black community, sexism and racism, he would have understood that gains in the black community could be easily undermined, easily undermined, if gender bias in any way reduced black women's participation in the public sphere and in the private sphere. If black women could be reduced to second class citizen on the basis of sexism, the black community could never prosper. 
A number of social forces, such as slavery, unemployment, lack of education, and crime contributed to black women being the heads of households. To the extent it existed, matriarchy is what black women got handed, not what they had planned or conspired to do. Black women, married and single, had a history of family and community leadership. The majority of black women worked. Seventy percent of the labor force, the black labor force, were paid black labor force were black women at the time of the report. They worked to help support their families, whatever their marital status. They had learned to be assertive and were more likely than men to pursue education. Yet, they earned less than black men and white women. And the, uh, uh, the idea that they would ever earn as much as white men was just unthinkable. Their ability to achieve, despite the disadvantages of both race and gender, should have been used as a model for everyone, rather than applaud or even recognize the industriousness of black women. Moynihan viewed their success as a threat to black men and the entire community. Moreover, and even worse, I would say, he portrayed black women as embittered women who made men feel inadequate and who chose welfare over marriage. Moynihan's declaration that blacks could only enjoy the American dream if black women relinquished control of their lives to men. Moynihan was wrong, and black women and some men knew it. Today, despite the increase in the number of black female-headed households, the black family has not, as Moynihan predicted, banished. Though it is, its continued survival is tenuous, the African-American family exists today because black women remain dedicated to their families and communities despite Moynihan's condemnation. We all know that we are not the threat to the black community or to black men. African American women's commitment to equality in every aspect of their lives has, in fact, benefited both black men and the black community as a whole. So today is in the past. Where are African American women? Well, they're working. They're sending their children to school. They're buying houses. They're keeping churches in their neighborhoods open and functioning. They serve as community leaders in places plagued by crime, failing schools, environmental hazards, and disease. They work and serve as leaders in the business and in not-for-profit. Black women are neither the overbearing shrews of the Moynihan Report, nor Ronald Reagan's lazy cheats, nor Bill Clinton's irresponsible freeloaders. And most importantly, we are not Don Imus's nappy-headed hoes. <laughs> nor, nor are we the bitches and hoes portrayed in some of today's music and videos. We are far too busy to wallow in victimhood, as some commentators on race claim. And for most of the population, leaving the workforce to stay at home with our children is not a viable economic option. Black women know what it means physically, socially, and economically to possess both gender and race. They know that both race and gender equality must be realized if either is to be achieved. In the American population, two-parent households are on the decline and may soon cease to be the model for measuring family stability. The number of white women and all women of color who, because of divorce, are heads of their household is increasing, as is the number of babies being born to mothers who are not married and never been married. As Alice Coase correctly put it, Moynihan's mistake was in assuming trends that he saw in black families were somehow peculiar to the black community and that white families were a model of stability. We know now that that was not the case. But Coase, a black journalist who writes about race and often gets it right, failed to give African American women credit for persevering in spite of Moynihan's pessimistic assessments. 
Our determination to build our lives, our families, and our community, despite harsh perceptions, is evidence in our belief in the, of our belief in the promise of America. So what did black women do in response to Boydahan's uh, report? Well, we did what we're doing today. We took advantage of the rise in opportunities that existed in the 60s. And we are continuing to do so. And we have evidence that we took advantage of those opportunities right here in this room. We must continue and expand despite the change in social, and those, those, I shouldn't say change, I should say change yes, change yes in social and political climate. Despite those changes, we have to continue to take advantages of, advantage of the opportunities available for us. How can we still believe in the American dream? Well, we have no choice. And what follows is uh, what I would say are five pledges. I, st I st struggle with words. The five pledges of what we must do to make, what that we must make in our lives to keep us believing in that dream. And I started to say five mandates, five pledges, five promises, five edicts. I couldn't really come up with the right words. But I'm going to start with five pledges. And you can tell me. And I know I should. I knew not to say edicts because I know not to tell you what to do. You know what to do in your life, and your evidence of it right here today. But the first thing I would say that we have to do is we have to think beyond Brown versus the Board of Education to a broader vision of educational equality. Now, what do I mean by that? Well. In the 50s and 60s, in particular, our mother's generation saw to it that the school doors were open to our children, regardless of race and gender. That was our mother's generation job. We, they gave us access. And so what that means is between 1976 and 1995, college degrees awarded to African-American women increased from 33,500 to over 55,000. In 2004, women, black women, received nearly 3,700 professional degrees and 1,900 doctorate degrees. Now, despite racial tensions that tend to continue to linger on college campuses, that graduation rate can only be prescribed or described as positive. The fact that many of the women receiving degrees during that period were first generations in their families to go to college, and certainly the first to get degrees, makes the numbers especially impressive. In all likelihood, these graduates will earn more money over their lifetimes than their girlfriends from high school who did not, and in some cases, could not attend college. Better jobs and more money were not the only motivation for the 5,600 black women who spent extra years and money and effort that it took to get a doctorate or a professional degree. Some of us came into the academy and stayed. Uh, we were looking for a professional home when we got here, and we have remained. We've learned that educational equality demands more than getting into the classroom. We can't stop the access uh, drive. We have to continue that drive, but we've got to build on to that drive. As more and more African American women are getting degrees, we have and will continue to change the content of the curriculum and the way that the curriculum is delivered and the environment for the delivery of that content. So we have to look at education in a holistic point way. We can't just say, well, it's enough that we get in. And we all know that. All those of us who went to college when there were so few of us here, I went to college, I went through all through uh, K through, or actually first grade, I didn't go to kindergarten, first grade through college without having an African American st instructor. Those days have to be in the past. And I think that shaped not only my way of thinking about education, but unfortunately it shaped the way of some of my uh, white classmates' way of thinking about education and authority and knowledge and intellect. Now, what that means for us today is that as we think beyond Brown, 
we have to understand the importance of our presence and our voice in academic environment. By introducing a diversity of subjects into the curriculum and relying on a larger variety of resource material, we are offering a broader vision of educational e equity as well as education itself. And that broader vision is going to serve all students for the better as we begin to participate in the global society you hear about so often. In college campuses across America, we are developing our ideas about a variety of things. And one of the impacts that I see we, ha we are having in particular uh, is on women's studies programs. Uh, and I believe that our ideas are going to have a profound influence on what we call feminism today. Feminism today, I believe, will be moving more and more toward the promotion of community development. Ideas that uh, the idea of feminism based on community development is based on the, our knowledge that liberation depends on elimination of both sexism and racism at the very least. As poet, activist Audre Lorde put it, without community there is no liberation. Secondly, so we've got to develop a broader sense of educational equality and quality. Second thing we have to do is we've got to be ready, black women, to integrate America. One workplace at a time. <laughs> and that is that we live increasingly in uh, segregated residential areas. And that is a fact. In many cases, so uh, our schools are becoming more segregated over the years. Integration uh, is, uh, to paraphrase uh, uh, one, uh, one politician, integration today and tomorrow. I am an integrationist, and I believe that it's society, all of society will benefit from it, and it's the place where I believe it is going to take place right now is in the workplaces. I'm going to stop here and tell you a story. And it's, you know, I, uh, none of these things that I'm going to tell you I think are going to be easy or foregone conclusion. But I'm going to tell you a story. And maybe some of this, just a story about a woman named Mary. And maybe some of it sounds a little familiar to you, at least some aspect of it. Um, now, this is a woman who grew up in, in a rural area. She started working on, on um, she's a, uh, we won't say what age she is, but you know, she's uh, roughly somebody who would have been around in the 1965 when the Moyne Hearn Report was issued. She started working on a family farm at age 11, all four foot five, 75 pounds of her. When she graduated first in her high school class, her mother insisted she go to college. For Mary, college was a relief from the farm. She and Bill met shortly after she graduated from college and began her teaching career. They soon married and like most couples, planned their lives together. They would buy a home, they would have children, and in fact, they did both. Between work and having children, she got her master's degree. With the third child, they got a bigger home with enough acreage so that their three children could run and play without fear of cars, and she could garden like her mother did. They would travel build a barn, own horses. They both would work two jobs at a time, and aunt, grandmother, or older cousin kept, kept the children. They had a social life, a church home, old friends and new friends. But then one day, Bill was diagnosed with leukemia, and four months later, he was gone. Mary threw herself into her grief, and then into her children and their grief, and then into her work. In her mind, she was doing the job of two people now. She sent her children to college. And once the children were out of the house, out of college, she threw herself even further into her work. She owned over a dozen suits, and her hair was always neatly coiled. 
She moved from her teaching job to become a principal. She spent a year in the school district administration where she recruited and advised on diversity. And one by one, she checked off the goals she and Bill had set together and those she set for herself. In time, Mary took care of ailing parents, then their estates, and then one day she hit a wall. Her progress at work had stalled. She wasn't sure whether it was a glass ceiling, whether it was burnout, or whether she had just made the wrong choice about profession. But at 55, five foot one and 130 pounds, she was ready to retire. And that's what happens to us. What happened in the, between the years of 1990 and 2001, African American women's employ, employment increased 43%. We are there in those workplaces. But black women in the United States still earn only 68 cents for every dollar earned by men. And in addition to, to the impacts of race and gender bias on earnings, black women suffer from what economist Julianne Malbo calls the third burden. With no second income, the dollars women earn, black women earn are stretched further. That second income is also increasingly unreliable uh, for white families and other families of color, uh, all families regardless of work. But work is more than about income and the ability to purchase even something as important as a home. Work defines us. And how many of you know that Mary, or how many of you are that Mary, who are there every day in that workplace making sure you've got just the right clothes, that your hair looks just perfect, that every time that you go into a meeting that you are overprepared and you're still waiting to be heard. Or how many of you are that Mary who is called upon constantly to make sure that other people of color are included? Because, of course, those people who are in charge of doing that just can't quite figure out how to get the job done. That is us. I, Julianne Malvo calls it that third burden. I think a lot of us are suffering from that third, fourth, fifth, and sixth burden, too. We are trying to figure out all of these things. And I, I say it was, it's, it's, it's amazing to me that I, my colleagues are wonderful colleagues and wonderful people. But sometimes, and they always talk about the disadvantages of this, the burden of identity can be overwhelming. But nothing for Simmons women is impossible. <laughs> I learned that today. Work not only defines us as individuals, uh, but it defines us as a society. And how America is going to be remembered and how America is going to be read in large part will depend on what the workplaces look like. So despite the racial diversities in some cities, we still reside in neighborhoods where other people look like us mostly. We interact socially with people of the same race. How can we move forward? I often, t I started out uh, doing workplace discrimination issues because I really feel the workplace is critical. We are defined by the workplace. When we think about slavery, when we think about Jim Crow, when we think about all of the burdens of race and gender in the past, the workplace was where it was at many, in many ways at its most profound because it kept us from any opportunities of developing economically as a, as a group. I believe we have got to continue as, as hard as it is, not only to see the workplace as a place for our economic gain, but really have to implore our employers to see it as a reflection of the society, the integrated society that we all should be listening, living in. And so when that, that employer, when we hit that glass ceiling because of our gender or because of our race, 
It is a reflection on all of society. What goes on is, is the shaping of the American attitude about, about us as women of color in that workplace. Once we are out of school, the majority of us are going to be working someplace. So the issue for me is larger than just our economic gain, and we want to gain there too. We want to make sure that we are gaining economically, that we get our wages up to the equivalence of other groups. But work, we have to continue to see work as an effort to make sure that all of society understands that an integrated society is what is best for the entire society. In examining the role uh, employment plays in social integration and networking for African American women and their families, I present a challenge to employers to ensure that black women achieve their potential in the workplace. But I also challenge black women to look in different arenas for employment. Different arenas, not that are inconsistent with maintaining our identity, but also in arenas where we can best be assured of success and, success and, uh, and promotion. Uh, one of the things that I, I quoted you, that figure about the increase in, in uh, the percentage of women working, uh, African-American women in the employment arena, one of the things that is telling about that is that the majority of those increases came in the health care arena. And, the, and now there's nothing wrong with the health care arena. But I think we need to start looking at, at is the health care arena a good place for promotion? and social integration and networking. And I would argue that it's not for two reasons. One, the structure of most healthcare facilities is pretty limited in terms of promotion. If you're talking about uh, hospitals, for example, the, 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 uh, the hospitals are run primarily for and by doctors. And unless you're in that medical area, there are going to be limitations on what you can do there. I think what we have to do, again, I'm not saying anything bad about hospitals or that you shouldn't work at hospitals because we need you in hospitals, trust me. We need you in health care. We need you everywhere. But we need to also evaluate where we're sending our students in terms of what is going to be their best opportunities, what fields, what profession, what arenas are going to be best for them in terms of promotion and advancement. Uh, that is the way we're going to change our workplace cultures. We're going to have to get into those cultures, and we're going to have to be able to advance into leadership roles in those cultures. The third thing we're going to have to do is to secure our own safe haven. And I say we've done a good job of this. There was, uh, we, and what do I mean by that? Our own safe haven, I'm talking about our family homes. And there are a variety of ways that we need to secure our family homes. And I think that this is the one area where we have got to have political leadership that is willing to help us. We are, I'm not just talking about what goes on within the home in terms of our safe haven. I'm talking about what goes on in the streets and our neighborhoods. And if we don't have law enforcement, mayors, local and state governments that are able to help us provide those safe homes and neighborhoods, we need to get new uh, officials. Those safe havens are critical to our advancement. The other aspect of that is, of course, this, this setback that we have had recently in um, the home mortgage arena. Uh, the really telling thing about uh, the, the good news about black women over the last decade or two was that our rate of home ownership was increasing. Increasing dramatically. There was a time when only couples bought homes. But uh, in the last two decades in particular, the number of, of, of factors uh, cultural factors have fueled a passion for home ownership among single black women. 
What happened with the subprime lending industry was that regardless of income, a lot of blacks, and particularly a lot of black women, were charged subprime rates when they qualified for uh, regular rates. And we don't, you know, you don't have to do anything but open up a paper in, on any given day to know how the subprime rate crisis and the, the mortgage crisis has impacted African American communities. What you may not know or what those stories may not tell you is that the impact in the communities have been uh, largely on African American women because they were making up the biggest portion of those new home buyers. And so we are at a crisis state. Now what does that mean? Now this is where we need uh, a couple of things. The important thing now is that we have some way of helping those communities. And I know our state and local officials have in fact um, come up with some plans for you know, some kind of buyouts of those homes that have been foreclosed on. But we need to go back and examine the national policies that encouraged the crisis to start with. And we need to go back and look at the leadership that allowed that crisis to take place and some of the policies. Everyone says now, in, in retrospect, we were so busy trying to encourage home ownership, and we thought that was such a good thing. But no one is taking, on a national level, very few people are taking responsibility for the role that the government played in allowing the subprime crisis to take hold in poor African American communities and middle class African American communities. Yet, when you talk to candidates, uh, when you talk to the presidential candidates, or even when the presidential candidates talk about these issues, they rarely talk about subprime lending. We have to hold our leaders accountable for this because we have to know how we're going to move into the future. We're not simply talking about homes, individual homes, we are talking about the economic base of an entire community. That's where most of our uh, equity, that's where most of what we have for value is in our homes. There has got to be a comprehensive policy that helps us find those safe homes in the communities where we want to live as well as provides us the sanctity and security that we need in those communities. The work has to take place on two, on two fronts. Uh, now what are the alternatives for African American women today? Uh, unfortunately, with the crisis as it is in some of our communities, one of the choices is for us, if we want to have that home that increases in value, that is safe, the choice is for us to buy outside of the African American, traditional African American communities. That is a choice. And no one would say it's a, a reasonable choice. If you want to talk about accumulation of wealth, that is one of the places where wealth will best accumulate. And I wouldn't fault you for doing that. That's what I've done. But I would say that as we do that, we also have to hold our politicians accountable for making sure that those African American communities can sustain the value of the homes that are there. And that's a big policy question that is going to take years and years of work and years and years of our consideration. The fourth thing that I think we have to do is we have to participate in what I call saving the community soul. On any given Sunday morning in any African American church or what's called traditional black churches, women occupy two out of three seats. Maybe more, you say. Where the struggle for the soul of the community is at stake, women must participate as leaders. 
leaders in the churches. Now, I know there's been some religious re rejection of the idea of women as leaders, but I only believe that if, if women, uh, only if women can come on as leaders in the church, where they live, where they worship, whatever form of worship is, only can then, only then can the church actually define adequately the role that it's going to play in our communities. Women have to have that input. We are the ones who are living in those communities. You're keeping those churches open. We, are, we have been doing so for years. We're doing the work. Uh, and it is critical. Our participation is critical at this time where our cities are characterized by violence and despair. It is those churches where many of us grew up and it's those churches which I believe can really provide an answer to that desperation and that violence. Some church leaders are talking about uh, what they call a functional family model that acknowledges the role extended families play in raising and nurturing children. Uh, some researchers are even proving that black churches can impact behavior that affect women in the community. For example, showing that religious involvement, specifically church attendance, protects against domestic violence and that this protective effect is stronger for African American men and women who experience higher rates, higher rates of reported domestic violence. Programs sponsored by black churches have also been shown to play positively in helping women kick cocaine and nicotine addiction. However, we also have to look at the history of sexism in the church. And we have to ask ourselves whether the church involvement, as it has stood historically in defining manhood, is actually good for women and for the community, and how it could be better. How can the church be better at helping us work through these issues of violence in our homes and in our communities? How can we use the church to give us models for what it means to be a man in this uh, century. You know, it's, it's interesting for some of you, some of us who grew up in the civil rights era or came of age in the civil rights era, uh, we always thought of the church as the largest influence in the community. We are in danger of that changing. And whether it's what you, what you want to call the prison culture or pop culture, that is changing. How can we get that back? Through shared leadership in the church. And that shared leadership means women. We have to take back our images. The fifth thing, we got to get them back. See Dolores Tucker, an African-American woman, publicly complained about sex and violence and hip hop lyrics in, the, in I believe, the 1980s. Uh, and a lot of the artists dismissed her as being a prude. Others denounced her as being anti-black and an enemy of free expression. The point that Tucker raised and in which the black artists avoid uh, uh, discussing is that there is racism not just sexism, but there is racism in the way that black women are portrayed in music videos. And I suggest to you that the racism not only is with the artist, but is also the production. Uh, it seems to me that there would be a very different response from producers if black artists, artists were rapping and portrayed white women in their videos. The producers would, I believe, respond very differently if you said to them, let's put your daughter in the videos. So in addition to what is happening in terms of promoting sexism, I don't think the artists ever come to terms with the fact that they are also promoting racism by using black women's bodies and images in the way that they do. When Don Imus, the talk show host, called the women on the Rutgers team, uh, the, the phrase that he used, 
uh, the issue of negative imagery of African American women in popular culture could no longer be easily dismissed. They did miss C. Dolores Tucker, but we had to come to terms with it when Imus made his statement. The most impressive response to Imus, the Imus incident was a market response, I think, where uh, consumers, advertisers, uh, financial markets all sort of came together on this issue and said, look, uh, we've got to at least make a statement about this. The, also, the important thing was that we found out how few or how little control uh, African American women had over the content of marketing of our images in, uh, in popular culture. Whether the, the, uh, the failures uh, of the system have been corrected, I doubt it. It remains to be seen whether there has been a market correction of this problem. But I believe exposing the failings has, is important and can lead to a, a better approach. I, if you look on the internet, you can find any number of things. You can find words and images that are vile, that are vulgar, that are incendiary, that are misogynist, that are sexist, that are racist. You can find words that encourage criminal behavior being promoted openly on the market. Yet as unsettling as they will be, a fight against this kind of merchandising with a call for its removal from the market is doomed to fail. We're not going to get it off the market. I was watching, uh, right after the Imus comment, I was watching a show, an Oprah show, uh, where she had the producers. There were several black artists and black producers on, in the lineup on her show. And here was the most powerful woman in media. And all she could do was ask these individuals to stop doing that. She couldn't make them stop. Now, if the most powerful woman in media, and I, I don't think I exaggerate when I say that, can't get them to stop, then I don't think that their answer is to say stop. It's just not going to happen. It, it, there are too many uh, uh, factors that are, some of them political or economic, that are going into this. But what we can do, is to promote women into positions where they can control the content. <laughs> where we can promote women's use of imagery for themselves. There are executives who are coming up the pipeline, hopefully some of them coming from Simmons, who will be in the decision uh, decision-making positions about whose material gets aired and whose material gets promoted. I don't think we're ever going to be able to eliminate it, but we ought to flood the market with our own ideas and our own values and our own versions of ourselves. And that we may never be able to say we've won the war, but then again, I think we will have won the war. If I can promote someone who can put positive imagery uh, out there and in the public fray, then that is winning. Stopping these other images is not going to be our victory. But putting our own imagery out there will be. And we've, that is the only way we are going to take back who we are. We get to define it, we get to design it, and we get to promote it. Now, <clears throat> now finally, finally, we have to become the political leaders we deserve. Um, it was inevitable this year. It was irresistible. It was inevitable. Presidential candidates Barack Obama, as you know, and Hillary Clinton could not avoid questions of how race and gender impacted their chances for becoming president. Unfortunately, through their surrogates, many of them did this by pitting racial discrimination against gender discrimination or vice versa. So we were seeing, these were seen as, well, what's worse, race or gender? Now, that put those of us who live both 
in sort of an impossible position um, and, uh, of choosing you know, which characteristic, not only which characteristic you know, was a disadvantage, but which one mattered the most to us. Uh, now, in 1972, uh, Shirley Chisholm ran for president, and she had made a famous statement that says that she had experienced a bigger impediment because of her race. But I think for most of us, we don't know. How do we know? I remember once I had a uh, dean who said uh, he wanted me to be on this committee. And I was, you know, as usual, I was on air, like every committee of the school and had rotated. I said, you know, I don't want another committee. So I mean, he, and I said, you know, I'm sure you want a person of color on this committee. And he said, well, no, I actually wanted a woman. And I said, oh, well, that's great. You mean when I go into this, I won't have to be black? <laughs> it, it, it is though you can't, they can, people can't even comprehend what it's like to embody both. In the 2008 primaries, the choice for many black women was between the world we hope for and the world we believe in. Not his race versus her gender. But choosing between idealism and pragmatism isn't easy either. We have learned to survive by relying on a healthy dose of both idealism and pragmatism. For us, the promise of America can only be achieved through a combination of both. In his March 18, 2000 address on race, Barack Obama uh, it, it, that he gave was for me one of the most important speeches of my lifetime. In addition to helping white people understand black anger with America, Obama was trying to convince the American pub public to elect him as uh, president. Now, given that dual burden, I think Barack Obama's speech went a long way in bridging the black-white divide. Obama, a person with an African-American father and a European-American mother who lived for many years with his great-grandparents, has had to bridge this racial divide in ways that others have not. And he is counting on, and those of us who believe in him, are counting on his, his leadership skills along with his life experience to bring America closer to a post-racial society. But Obama's election will not provide the definitive proof that blacks and whites have reconciled their differences. So do not be disappointed if he is elected president and we don't heal. Because of both his skin color and his ancestry, he may be viewed by both whites and blacks as an exception and not a regular black person, like the one we see every day. <laughs> Barack Obama's speech on race didn't address the role his gender plays in the political arena. It did not. And it probably could not have, because he probably doesn't even understand the role his gender plays. And observations about media gender bias against Clinton often does ring true for many black women. However, if Hillary Clinton thinks her appearance is overly scrutinized, she should consult with one of us <laughs> who feels the undue attention to hair, dress, weight, all of those based not only on gender, but also on race as well. So how do we become, how do we answer all of the questions. Are we serious about race, bridging the racial divide? Are we serious about bridging this gender divide in this country, understanding both racism and sexism? If we are serious about having a conversation on either race or gender in this country, but particularly if we're serious about both, black women along with other women of color must be reflected in our leadership. Black women's advancement in education, employment, religious, and community leadership must translate into roles as elected officials in or at the highest levels. If you want to have a serious conversation about racism and sexism, you have to include women of color. The women in this room embody both, and they, like no one else, 
can have that conversation without having the two competing with each other as to which one is the worst. So where is that American dream today? As an African-American woman, I talk about African-American women's experiences not to divide us, not to divide us or to say that we are uh, entirely unlike everyone else, or to say we are victims. But I believe our stories speak to the hopes of all America, all Americans. We long to educate our children to own homes and feel safe and secure in them, to be members of loving, caring families, to worship and honor the faith of our choice, and to be leaders in all these arenas, whether it's family, community, or in public life. In 2008, I am privileged to teach and witness the coming of age of a generation that seeks to move beyond historic race and gender divisions. I don't think we quite know how. But I know that for them, moving beyond these divisions means something that is, involves including. As my generation moves forward, we must leave the next one with guidance for achieving a truly inclusive America. And I'm not talking about just a tolerant America. I'm talking about an inclusive America. To do so, black women must claim our full citizenship. And we must insist insist on a vision of equality. We must insist on a vision of equality that includes our voices, our lives, and our values. And one day, one day, the country will fully hear us. These are no small tasks. And I don't think that we can do it alone without government help, without public policy help, without the help of well-meaning men. These are no small tasks, but as the song says, nobody told us the road would be easy. We are, and we must be, the American dream we desire. So as you go through your program this week, I'd like you to focus on the issues that you're going to be addressing in each one of these sessions, but I also like for you to focus on the bigger goals, not only for yourself, but for our entire country. We are the American dream. Thank you. Thank you.